good afternoon and namaste everyone welcome to the session 6 of decoding the idea of communist china i am yogita a research associate with the forum in mm. this session we will discuss the topic decoding china's geopolitical ambitions the session chair is dr nand kishore dr nand kishore ms is an associate professor department of politics and international studies at mm. pondicherry university He holds an MPhil and PhD in political science from Hyderabad Central University, Hyderabad, India, and completed postdoctoral at the University of Leiden, Netherlands, with Erasmus Mundus Fellowship from the European Union. Dr. Kishore was a recipient of the Short Term Junior Research Fellowship from UNHCR Brookings, Government of Finland. He is a senior fellow at Defence Research and Studies, Tiras in India, analyst at Islamic Theology of Counter Terrorism, London. and a visiting fellow to AIDIA Kathmandu the speakers for this session are ambassador anil trignuayat dr benjamin barton and dr don mclean chill i welcome all the speakers and request dr nand kishore to proceed with the session over to you sir thank you um, it's indeed a pleasure to uh, be amidst the uh, galaxia speakers an extremely well thought um, conference so congratulations to indic forum i also had the opportunity of chairing a session uh, last evening uh, what we are discussing today is also a very very uh, important topic and also of greater geopolitical relevance that is decoding china's geopolitical ambitions as introduced by the um, the the mc we have ambassador anil trigunia a great friend of and also a great scholar uh, whom you must have all come across these days gideon chitanga then we also have dr benjamin barton and then uh, our good friend don mcclain uh, gill as well here so without wasting much time as audience want to uh, listen to the speakers first i would introduce ambassador anil uh, he is a member of the indian foreign service he has served uh, in the indian missions in uh, different places including bangladesh mongolia United States, Russia, Sweden, Nigeria, Libya, Malta, and Jordan. In the Ministry of External Affairs, he worked in the Economic uh, West Asia, North Africa, Gulf, uh, and Consular Divisions. He also served as Director General as well as Joint Secretary for the Gulf and the Hajj Divisions in the Ministry of External Affairs, New Delhi. Thereafter, Mr. Trigunyad or Ambassador Trigunyad worked as a Deputy Chief of Mission in the rank of Ambassador in the Embassy of uh, India in Moscow. is a member of the all india management association also delhi management association it's a great pleasure to have you here sir over to you for the next 20 minutes thank you thank you thank you mr chairman um, and i thank the indic researchers forum as well as the chinese uh, c3s that sounds very interesting and since uh, last two days have been very very um, engaging i have checked in a couple of uh, panels and i find that it is one of the most comprehensive um, i think the analysis by very distinguished speakers about how do we decode china or decipher its policies in different regions uh, for a few decades now i think the china has actively begun to lock its strategic and geoeconomic interests more comprehensively with the west asian region preponderantly islamic by religion saudi arabia and iran as you both know are the leaders of sunni and shia sects they have been at war and odds all through and continue to be uh, dividing the region in such such a way and the world islamic world in that sense of the term but both of them have superbly close relationship with china all of them all the middle eastern countries including israel support in a part of the chinese bri project so if you wish to look at china in the islamic world you may perhaps for the sake of ease look at it as the oic let us say 57 countries of the oic which is a second largest international organization after the united nations it covers countries from asia to africa to other elsewhere 
But since the real pivot lies in West Asia, by way of the religious leadership, resources, sea lanes of communications, it is good to analyze, in my view, the China relationship from that pivot with the Islamic world. It is also very important and because just because they are the leaders in this Islamic world, Saudi Arabia, for example, the King Salman is the custodian of the holy mosques. The Iranians claim to be the Shia chiefs and so on and so forth. But then at the same time, you have China where the Western countries are chasing a mirage of human rights violations as far as the poor Uyghurs are concerned. And the West Asian countries of the Islamic world in general continues to have a marked silence, except occasional muted mansions, sometimes by Turkey, some other countries, just merely a pro forma one or to attract attention. You remember some time back, even the former Pakistani prime minister Imran Khan was asked exactly what are they doing about it. They said we were briefed by the Chinese side and we are satisfied with it. Now that shows the power of China in the region, whether it is South Asia or whether it is in West Asia or Africa or elsewhere. So we are seeing in the meantime that the authorities in China are continuing to brutally erase any seeds of Islamic thought in Xinjiang. They are sinicizing the faith with practices that violate Islamic law and practice and call potential ethnic identity or nationalist sentiment among the region's Turkic Muslim population. And we know that this has been happening in many parts of China. It has happened to the Mongols and others also. So this is something that continues. But if you were to look at the China's policies in the region, they have mostly been under the American radar. We have seen that they have not challenged the USA being the arbiter of security in the Middle East. They did not want to challenge, nor are they capable of providing it. But under that umbrella, they have been continuing to enrich their relationships with uh, the Middle East, all the countries. But they also, like India, have been able to manage the relationships and build friendly relationships with nearly all states in Asia. While they kept a respectable distance from the regional conflicts and rivalries. But on the other hand, the United States becomes involved as a force and try to force the change in the region, even though in turn we know that it has always been far more congenial uh, towards the autarchic or autocratic rulers that has been their case. But this is something that is the China has been able to very well manage, like us also for that matter. Like it has good relations with Israel, it has very good relations with Saudi Arabia, it has excellent relations with Iran, and the United Arab Emirates is this poster child in the region for its cooperation. It is also continuing as block with GCC countries, it has been trying to have a free trade agreement and all that. It has also signed recently a 25 years strategic cooperation agreement in 2021 with Iran, which raised the antennas in many parts of the world exactly what it is. But that also shows that at the same time, China follows a policy of comprehensive strategic partnerships, strategic partnerships and innovative partnerships with different types of regions, uh, countries in the region. So for it, Saudi Arabia is a comprehensive strategic partner. So is Egypt and so is UAE and so is Iran. Uh, that is something that shows that to what extent it has been able to calibrate its own interests in the region. So we have to, when we are looking at it, we have to see it from that perspective, that it is following a policy, balanced policy with taking all the issues of mutual interest or shared interest as it's called with various countries and tries to have a degree of flexibility rather than a traditional alliance patterns. So it allows it to quarantine the problems and areas of disagreement. That is the way it is trying to go ahead. And that's why it is navigating its relationship, even though fractious, 
with very many countries without any problem. Now we know that China had, and I have also attended in India, uh, the West Asia Forum in China two years ago, before just before the pandemic. And that is an amazing place where one has to see the kind of cloud China has. So when it launched its uh, Arab policy paper in 2016, it said, it said at the time, the joint efforts will be made with Arab countries to promote the initiative under the principle of wide consultation, joint contribution, and shared benefit. It also stated that the China and Arab countries will follow a policy that is called one plus two plus three cooperation pattern. Now, what does that mean? Number one refers to energy cooperation. Number two, to the core infrastructure and construction and trade and investment facilitation. And number three relates to innovative technologies in nuclear energy, space satellite, and renewable energy. And that very year, as you know, President Xi Jinping visited Saudi Arabia, visited Egypt, and Iran, displaying the way it intended to move into the region. And it has gone on from there. The BRI becomes the knitting factor in all this. It has facilitated frequent high-level exchanges, visits between leaders of China and the West Asian countries. It has signed strategic cooperation agreements and partnerships with eight Arab countries and on the BRI-related construction projects. With seven countries out of the Gulf countries like Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE, etc., have also become the members, founding members, of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Now, these are very important uh, markers for its relationship because it is creating the institutional and infrastructural framework for the relationships to continue. And we have already seen its results uh, in recent times. But it is also, we, can, we must see like that, like the Sino-US trade war is really not about trade. It is more about politics. Likewise, the BRI is also not only about economics, it is also about the politics, and it will require a security dimension to, towards it as the United States moves towards the Indo-Pacific in accordance with its policy of pivot to Asia. So then at that time, this will become a strategic necessity for China to essentially uh, prevent any vandalizing of its projects, and then it will be used to securitize its investment and assets, which has been doing, whether it is ports or whether industrial parks across the region, everywhere. It has its uh, Maritime Silk Road Initiative. It has gone into the, um, the Digital Health Silk Road Initiative, Digital Initiative. It has started virtually in every single dimension. And you'll be surprised that during the pandemic, the Gulf countries, especially UAE, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, and others, they are the ones, Egypt, which are the ones where it has started off its own vaccine first and has been manufacturing locally and has been supplying to the different countries in Africa and elsewhere. So this is a this is the way that it has not lost out on anything. Of course, it is the largest buyer of the, uh, the Middle East oil, so it serves both the purpose. Very recently, you must have also seen about that Saudi Arabia and uh, China have agreed to trade in real and yuan. Now, that is a very important dimension because they are the biggest partner, trade partner is so Saudi Arabia there. So that is something that is important. Likewise, the UAE has also done the, exactly the same thing. Now, you can see that UAE on the one hand is going ahead with the Americans, with the Israelis, the Abraham Accords and whatnot. On the other hand, it is also equally very, very strong uh, and very closely tied up with the Chinese. Iran has the same, uh, in the same situation, and all the other major powers that you look at, China continues to play an important role in this. Now, it is not only doing that, uh, but it is also trying to increase its influence through the regional outfits, or to get into the regional problems, trying to resolve them, and give a helping hand. For example, when the Iranians and US Americans wanted to work with uh, for the JCPOA, it was found that they were basically, Chinese tried to help a great deal, bring the Iranians on the table, and once again, it is being done. And that is why Barack Obama himself 
and President Xi Jinping for all the constructive role that he played in bringing about this. And now, even today, <coughs> Iran, China is playing uh, a great role in this, although, as you know, like it also wants its share of the pie in everything that it does. Like the Russians also played at the same time, but today they are on a very different wicket. So they, all of them want it. We have also seen one more thing I, I would like to tell you is that the exchanges have continued to grow between these um, the, this region and the countries. Whether it is Pakistan, Malaysia, all those CPEC, everything is seen to be connected in one goal. So they are looking at it in a very comprehensive manner. And why we should talk about this more often, because in my view, because for us, India, Middle East, or Gulf countries, especially in the West Asia, are extremely important from our own sustenance point of view, if nothing else. They are strategically so very important. So we should not have a situation where we would be confronted with some kind of a zero-sum game. Today, we have excellent relationship with all the West Asian countries, but we have to keep watching. We have to keep enriching our ties with each one of these countries by being more proactive. And that's why it's extremely important that we have to. Likewise, in the Qatar blockade, in the Palestinian issue, in the Israel-Hamas issue, everywhere you will see the Chinese offer to mediate. They have been not very actively involved, but from behind the scenes, they have been doing it. So they are they basically, in one way, you can say that they do not believe in the politics among nations, but rather trying to bring the politics among networks. And that is something, and believe in connectivity, are continuing to do that with maximum diplomacy. One more thing is that in recent times, they have also uh, not only exchanges, I mean, you must be aware that during the Beijing uh, Olympics, Winter Olympics, not many leaders came from the world. West Asia, all the West was boycotting the Olympics on because of the Uyghurs and the human rights violation by China. But the leaders from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman, Iran, Bahrain, all of them were present there. The, in, in, uh, meeting the Chinese Communist Party and President Xi Jinping. So that is something that shows you that what is the key that China holds for them is a strong economic stakeholdership. And that's where we need to have a very keen uh, interest and pursue exactly uh, what China is doing and how we can uh, keep our own interests intact in this kind of situation. China also does not like external powers, although it is not going to, be going to become a security umbrella provider. But it also says that there is no power vacuum. When Wang Yi in this early, in the January, he visited these countries, he was very clear. He said, there's no power vacuum here because it's the power from outside that is causing a problem. So, and he said in one very interesting word he used was, we do not need patriarchy from outside. Now, this is something that you need to see that how it is connecting with the people without passing judgment on the leadership, what kind of, a, whether it is autocratic, whether it is democratic, or it doesn't matter to them as long as their economic interests are soft. So I think that um, China is there for the long haul. It is going to increase its stance uh, a great deal. Its trade and investment have gone from $20 billion to over $200 billion. Its investments have grown and it has taken all huge projects including in Israel, for that matter, and the Americans are not that happy about it. And we have seen what is the result now. When the Russians invaded Ukraine, you have seen UAE abstain with India. They are in the Security Council. Israel did not condemn. Turkey condemned, but continued to work with the Saudi Arabia did not go. They refused to take the call from President Biden also. For different reasons, they refused to increase the production of oil under the OPEC plus in which they are partners with Russia. So they are trying to identify the Gulf countries a little more independence and as we say strategic autonomy for themselves and more partnership with either China or Russia. Of course it will lot will depend on how the eventually the politics plays out of it. And recently Syria signed up the Belt and Road Initiative also and so did Morocco is working on. So I think that there there, there is a very comprehensive plan. And I know I'm completing my time, so I'll just stop here. But I would like to tell one thing, that China and the Middle East is a red flag that we must continue to monitor at all times and see to it how we are all going to work in the region that is absolutely imperative and essential for us. I'll stop here. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you.
thank you sir i think that was an excellent uh, proposition that's like listening from the horse's mouth uh, absolutely uh, brilliant sir uh, i would have uh, loved to listen to you even for the next one hour given a chance i think we will certainly listen to you i think there are many uh, scholars who are keen to ask you questions i would request all of you uh, to even wait for uh, the question answer session but in the meanwhile you can also use the chat box and put up uh, your questions so that it can be uh, very um, what to say specific to this particular session and to whom you are addressing to that would make it uh, much more interesting so that they can also answer specifically but you have questions for all the uh, speakers you can also write that way you can ask uh, for the whole panel and that's also a possibility uh, thanking you sir and we move on to the second presentation that is dr benjamin barton is an associate professor in the department of politics history and international relations at the university of nottingham malaysia his area of research is largely that focuses on chinese foreign policy particularly chinese economic statecraft as expressed via the belt and road initiative and the maritime silk road chinese security policy pertaining uh, predominantly to its relations to the african continent as well as its bilateral relations with the european union uh, it's it's a pleasure to um, have you dr benjamin uh, now over to you for the next 20 25 minutes you can take there's no problem thank, thank you um, dr kishore and uh, thank you also to uh, ambassador anil for the wonderful presentation to start us off with um i was asked to um, give an overview of uh, the evolution of EU-China relations, so between the European Union and uh, the People's Republic of China. So what I'll try and do is to provide you with a, a brief overview from the turn of the 21st century until uh, contemporary times. And uh, where possible, I'll try and frame that within a geopolitical lens. Uh, of course, uh, that's going to be the theme running through the, the presentation. It won't really be uh, too long in terms of the number of slides, but I'll try and provide a bit more depth where possible. So um, if you go back two decades, uh, EU-China relations were, uh, everything was hunky-dory. I exaggerate, but uh, it's true. This was, as was called in the literature, the quote-unquote honeymoon, honeymoon period, um, when the EU and China were beginning to get to, the leaders on both sides were getting to know each other a bit better. They began institutionalizing their bilateral relations. I'll touch upon that. Uh, as I move forward. And really there was a sense, you know, that um, given the geopolitical context at the time, that the EU and China could perhaps forge something um, which might redirect the nature of international relations. There was, this might sound like an exaggeration, but I think there was really a belief on both sides that this could happen. Now, perhaps that belief wasn't necessarily shared, but at least the EU had certain beliefs about what it could do with this bilateral relationship. And likewise, on the Chinese side, there was also the sentiment that perhaps uh, Chinese leaders could get the EU more on board with its multipolar vision of international relations. After that, I'll move, I'll accelerate to modern times, where although uh, there is still an emphasis on cooperation bilaterally, uh, we are now in what I would call the era of systemic rivalry. So um, I'll, I'll come to that afterwards and then finish up with a few uh, brief conclusions. So systemic rivalry, I think the EU and the European Commission, which is you know, the, the main supranational uh, agency of the European Union, has started to recognize that um, treating China uh, on terms of cooperation and engagement alone is simply not feasible anymore. Now, I'm going to be quite critical of the EU because I think it's taken those officials in Brussels and in the member state capitals too long to come to recognize this, but I guess better late than never. Um, in order to achieve what the EU wants to achieve vis-a-vis -vis its relations with China. So, I mean, if we go back uh, even further back than the advent of the 21st century, uh, I can go all the way back to the 1970s. Of course, this is when uh, you have the um, onset of the Sino-Soviet split, uh, the Kissinger ping pong diplomacy, and uh, under Nixon, the rapprochement between Washington and Beijing. Uh, of course, at that time, with the normalization of US-China relations, many European capitals uh, also normalized their bilateral relations with China, even though there had been some exceptions, notably the French, 
uh, who had already recognized the, the People's Republic of China in 1964 um, as the representative of China and no longer the Republic of China. So in terms of the EU, now the EU at the time is called the European Economic Community, right? It's not the, um, it's not the um, large over incumbent uh, body that uh, it is today, all encompassing. Uh, it is at the time still a relatively small organization which is focused almost exclusively on trade, uh, internally, externally. Although it is this period when European countries under the aegis of the European Economic Community are going to start to try and harmonize their foreign policies a little better than they had done previously. And so this, in, in the context of, of China, 1978, of course, by then, um, there's China's in the midst of its own political transition. Uh, the, the EEC and China signed a, a trade agreement, which is going to be upgraded in 1985. And that's going to form the legal basis of the relationship for, um, in, in fact, it's still, it still has relevance today uh, in terms of its uh, uh, judicial applicability. So the EU, that tells you, I guess, one of two things. Uh, one is that the EU is quite, I guess, um, forthcoming in its uh, vision of what China was likely to become, because this is also the period of China's gradual opening up. Uh, and two, it also tells you that uh, evolution from a purely institutional perspective has been quite tricky for the EU and China. And I'll touch upon this um, in the, the next slide. But really, it's the turn of the 21st century um, after the two decades of, um, of, you know, kind of modernization in China. That's really when diplomatically, commercially and politically, the EU and China, are, I would say, at the height of their bilateral relationship and this is characterized by um, the attribution of course mo mostly coming from the Chinese side of the um, comprehensive strategic partnership nomenclature which uh, the ambassador referred to in the case of, of the Middle East. Now in the case of the Middle East uh, you know China has been attributing these terms gradually largely symbolically but also in a way to get um, countries to align themselves to, to particular needs that China may have. If you look into what there is in terms of the substance of the strategic partnership, there's not much. It's largely a fanciful term. But just to say that the fact that China attributed comprehensive strategic partnership back in 2003, you know, if we talk of the Middle East, only Iran, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia are granted, you know, such a term. Um, the, you know, the E was considered already back then to be of fundamental importance to China. And I think that that hasn't really changed, even if the nature of bilateral relations have become frostier over time and more competitive. Um, I still think that there is a part of the Chinese foreign policy community which sees the EU as possibly one of those axes to lean on in order to reshape the, uh, the world order. And, and in 2003, I, I believe that many perhaps many more than now, but many in uh, China's uh, foreign policy making machinery um, really saw that there was potential uh, with the EU. Now, 2003, of course, is a critical year because that's the year of the um, forlorn launch of the Iraq war, which, of course, is leading to a split uh, in the West with, on the one side, the Atlanticists uh, led by the United States, and the United Kingdom, George Bush Jr., Tony Blair as Prime Minister of Britain at the time, and some others. There's the Spaniards, the Polish, um, most of the Eastern and Central European countries who've just joined NATO and are soon to join the EU in 2004, siding with the United States. On the other hand, you've got France, Germany, and a host of other core EU member states, those who are usually the founding members, who are refusing to, to partic participate in this war and who are rejecting the war effort, saying that, you know, uh, as we all know by now, that the, the, the rationale for it was, was wrong uh, and was unfounded. So it's no surprise in a way that China, which is very adept at finding the cracks in, the, in European unity, came with, you know, all of this very bombastic rhetoric uh, and the desire to sign this comprehensive strategic partnership with the EU in 2003. And this is why, you know, I put the emphasis on the belief on China's side 
really that it could it could lean on the EU to help build a multipolar order, which obviously would be to the detriment of the unipolar structure, which was perhaps more prevalent in the early 2000s than it is today. But still, you know, it, this was part of you know China's core strategic goals is to you know narrow the scope of American primacy in various regions across the world, and the same goes for Europe too. Even though geographically, you know, these are two very distant neighbors. So the the comprehensive strategic partnership, I think, really upped the ante. It really stoked the fires of belief in Brussels and Beijing that there was something perhaps special about this bilateral relationship. And if you look purely at trade, you know, let's not forget that the EU's strongest foreign policy asset to date is not politics, it's not security, it's trade. Right? The EU is a formidable trade actor. And EU-China relations have blossomed since the 21st century from a purely trade perspective. So there's an infographic here on my slide, which tells you that in 2017, the bilateral trade volume was close to 600 billion euros. That figure is still relevant today, despite you know, the global downturn uh, triggered by the pandemic. Um, the only difference between 2017 and 2022 is that although the EU used to be China's number one trade partner, it is now ranked second behind ASEAN, which also indicates shifts in uh, supply chains and also in China's own economic interests and priority areas. So the EU has fallen back to second place, but that shouldn't really be seen as any kind of a relegation given the actual volume of um, bilateral trade relations. And so this has always been the anchor, if you like, to EU-China relations. The fact that from a trade and investment perspective, this is such an important relationship. And you've got a few extra uh, figures there um, in terms of FDI and um, the China's share in EU trade as well, which you can see is, is considerable and has largely been increasing. Although to this day, the United States still remains the EU's number one trade partner, which is um, somewhat, un, let's say, not really synchronized with patterns that we see across the rest of the world. So the ambassador mentioned the Middle East. China is the number one trade partner there. If you go to Africa, it's the same. If you go to most South Asian and Southeast Asian countries, it's the same. But in Europe, the United States still remains the number one commercial uh, partner. Now, although you know I'm present presenting this in a very positive light, um, there were, of course, some rumblings. There were areas of discontent, of course, as in any normal bilateral partnership. Uh, for one, the EU has an arms embargo on China, which dates back to the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. Uh, that's still in force today, even though the EU came close on two occasions to lifting it uh, for various reasons. Uh, it was unable. It decided not to. Uh, we can come back to those uh, later. At the World Trade Organization, uh, China would love for the EU to get to grant it market economy status because, of course, economically. Uh, that would increase uh, the China's ability to export goods to Europe. Uh, but of course, the EU has refused for economic uh, uh, re reasons, but also in terms of um, the job market, because uh, it's estimated that you know, there would be job consi considerable consequential job losses uh, triggered if the EU was to grant China market economy status at the WTO, uh, but also symbolically, because it would legitimize uh, the the ruling class in China, you know, which of course is uh, theoretically, ideologically, ideologically grounded on a variant of Maoism or Lenin, uh, Marxist-Leninism, but of course, as we all know, you know, China is probably one of the most capitalistic countries in the world, socialism with Chinese characteristics, and were the EU, which is also itself, you know, uh, the incarnate of neoliberalism, recognize China as a similar player. That gives extra, uh, you know, weight and legitimacy to the Chinese leadership. So the EU has always been reluctant to grant China that particular wish, uh, um, and it's also one of the few levers which Brussels actually has uh, over Beijing now. Um, there were normative clashes. We've heard from the ambassador earlier. He was talking about, you know, human rights. That's obviously been a contention, and, is, and nowadays remains very much at the forefront of European minds. 
And uh, of course, the other elephant in the room is the role of the United States, which for China is complicated because it's difficult for, for Beijing to necessarily disassociate uh, what the EU does and what the United States does. Of course, I've mentioned there are discrepancies, but usually, you know, the West tends to work in sync, uh, particularly on rather, rather prickly issues for China. This is not always the case, as we saw under the, the you know, the very um, ambiguous and uh, controversial presidency of Donald Trump. Um, but, you know, on the whole, uh, China knows that if it's dealing with the EU, somewhere, somewhere in the background, there's the United States. Um, and that's a reality which I think Beijing has fought hard to try to undermine, but to this day hasn't really succeeded because of the strength, you know, culturally, politically, um, militarily of the transatlantic uh, partnership. Now, over the years, if we accelerate into, you know, 2022, uh, over the past um, three, four years, but in fact, I would say even earlier, if you go back to the uh, advent of Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping to power, bilateral relations have really started to um, uh, show a few more cracks than they used to. Uh, the positive rhetoric, it's, it's there during summit meetings, but the problems are now starting to overtake uh, the rhetoric and the discourse pertaining to cooperation. And this despite the fact that in terms of just on a purely institutional level alone, if we look at the structure of EU-China relations, it's impressive. You know, it's it's quite developed, to be honest. The number of sectoral dialogues, the number of individual or joint policy papers which are released every year, the annual summit meetings between the leaders, uh, one which took place not too long ago, you know, the, the regular statements and, you know, the quite, well, quite frequent exchanges between diplomats on both sides um, is, it's quite dense. But despite this level of institutionalization, despite what, you know, liberal IR theory would teach us about trying to build that web uh, between two distant partners, the reality is that that has clearly not worked in the EU and China's favor because the elements of antagonism weigh more heavily than this process of institutionalization. And some scholars in the field have criticized this, saying that in any case, it's nice having all these sectoral dialogues some which are technical pertaining to trade, others which are political about human rights, but often they are just talking shops. Talking shops with the Chinese side in particular is very good at trying to simply kick the can down the road when you know rather prickly topics are brought up in specific sectoral issues. Um, and you know, although um, the EU and China have also tried to broaden the horizon of their bilateral relations by looking at areas of common interests, such as you know, development in Africa, climate change, um, and try to synergize uh, their attempts, the reality is that the problem areas have, are still there and have actually grown in importance over time. And this is what's led you know, the, the European Commission in its kind of revision of its China strategy to name China in 2019 as a systemic rival. So, and, and many of these are, are, you know, shared areas of concern with the United States. So, for instance, Trump on the, the trade war, which, you know, the, the ambassador mentioned, was all about the size of the, the, the bilateral deficit. Well, the EU has the same problem. So, although the volume of trade is, is wonderful in numbers, it clearly is only advantageous to China. And on the European side, there's only one member state which has a positive trade balance with China, and that's Germany. All the rest have rather negative trade balances. Uh, regular clashes over human rights, the EU standing up for you know, lawyers in China who work on human rights cases, attributing the Sakharov Prize to you know, dissidents of the uh, CCP's rule, uh, reaching out to Uyghur intellectuals and leaders, uh, rewarding them, providing them with protection, um, talking of uh, you know, the, 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 the Taiwanese dilemma, trying to bring up the issue of the South China Sea dispute, and trying to have some kind of involvement, even though thus far it's rather minimal. Still, these are signs of change on the European side. And I think that the war in the Ukraine has simply awoken the European leadership to the need to adopt a more realist approach to dealing with China. Uh, perhaps more defensive realism than offensive realism, but you know, recognizing that engagement, cooperation, it's not that these things have necessarily failed, but 
when dealing with the assertive leadership of President Xi, they are simply not enough. And she, I, I've talked a lot from the EU side towards China, but the fact is also that China has contributed very much to the you know poisoning or the the nature of bilateral relations because of you know Xi Jinping's illiberal turn. Not that the the leaderships in China before him were you know open to the concept of you know democracy or or, or, or whatnot, but the the reality is that under Xi Jinping, there's been clearly a drive to push back on Western liberal values. And those are at the core of the EU's foreign policy. So naturally, that only widens the schism which exists currently between Brussels and Beijing. So there are many reasons you know, for, for where this mistrust can be sourced from. Some scholars going all the way back to the literature in the 1990s that I, I had already identified this. Um, Harish Kapoor wrote a fantastic book about the e Europe and China being distant neighbors and I think that that book is still very much relevant today um, because you know for all of the figures pertaining to trade for all of the institutionalization the core of EU China relations remains mistrust and that gulf I think has only widened over time and I think you know one important variable which is often pointed to or perhaps not sufficiently enough pointed to um, with regards to China's rise as a power is 2007-2008 the global financial crisis and the perceived collapse of the Western model by the Chinese leadership and this was reflected in EU-China relations because what irks the Chinese leadership is that the EU in the early days at the turn of the 21st century, and even perhaps a little bit before that, really believed that China would simply be the next Japan or the next Korea. Sufficient engagement, sufficient acceleration of economic growth would lead naturally to democratization. And that is something which the Chinese Communist Party, which let's not forget, has a very long memory of these things, still, I think, irks the CCP. And that is also reflected in the nature of bilateral relations. So when China perceived, you know, with the Eurozone crisis, the, the, the collapse of the Western model, or at least, you know, a, clearly a, a moment of defeat. It did not hesitate to kind of switch the tone from one which is all about cooperation to one which was actually quite assertive, if not slightly patronizing, towards the EU. And it turned the, the dynamic of relations on its head, saying, you know, you tried to get us to do something which we did not want to do. So this is how you know, bilateral relations are, are going to work from now on. And that had really, I think, contributed to the fact that today, um, you know, that th the early premise and promise of bilateral relations has evaporated. Um, and so, as mentioned, now we've come to the point of, you know, systemic rivalry, and there's a whole host of issues which are on the table, which have simply further uh, widened the gulf. There's the issue of the Uyghur, minority in Xinjiang province, which has led to the EU imposing sanctions on China. China, for the first time in its history, reciprocated those sanctions, targeting specific political elites and think tanks across the EU, which was the timing of which was terrible because the EU and China were just about to sign their first big um, agreement since the 1980s, which was the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, a bilateral investment treaty, which had been under negotiation for the best part of a decade. And, you know, uh, when I mentioned earlier that that document signed in the 1980s has still got relevance, is because the EU and China have never been able to settle on terms, whether it's a partnership and cooperation agreement, whether it's this bilateral investment treaty, to try and revamp their bilateral, you know, the, the legal underpinnings of their bilateral relationship. And, you know, that obviously was, the timing was terrible, and that's now currently being, uh, is on hold because it, it requires the approval of the European Parliament. You've got the issue of Taiwan, you've got specific member states such as Lithuania standing up for the Taiwanese cause, welcoming the Taiwanese foreign minister, uh, and obviously, you know, creating tension, further tension uh, with, with China. Um, you've got the Chinese attempt to also undermine European unity by setting up um, the 17 plus 1 China Central Eastern Europe Forum, um, you know, which Brussels is often seen as a an, an yet another attempt by China to plant a Trojan horse to undermine 
European unity, which over time, actually, China's been quite good at doing by, you know, leaning on member states who have perhaps tricky relationships themselves with Brussels. That's currently the case, let's say, of the leadership in Hungary under Viktor Orban, in Poland under the uh, Law and Order Party. You know, China's quite good at sensing, you know, who can stand up for China when the time comes, you know, if it's on the South China Sea, on human rights, on Taiwan, on issues which China considers to be core to its own survival, you know, as, as a one... Uh, um, as a single ruling party running the nation. And so, um, you know, ultimately, the EU is now, I think, has, has obviously reconsidered uh, the, the, the core of its strategy towards China, and that is, you know, to perhaps put less emphasis on cooperation and alignment, but instead, uh, um, sorry, cooperation and engagement, but instead put more emphasis on alignment with like-minded entities such as the United States, of course, Japan, um, and the Quad. I mean, I think the Quad is uh, uh, something which the EU is not obviously part of, but is looking at very carefully in terms of how that might play out and where the EU can possibly stand. And, you know, across the, there are a host of, of issue areas where, you know, the EU more and more looks like it's standing up to China. Uh, and that's the case, for instance, um, in the South China Sea, in the Indo-Pacific, with regards to dealings on the African continent, the EU has launched its own global gateway program, which is reportedly coming with a backing of about 300 billion euros. That is purely and simply to rival the Belt and Road Initiative in you know, parts of the global south like Af the African continent. On the issue of Ukraine, China has been very ambivalent. Uh, most recently, the foreign ministry stated it's, you know, that um, NATO had effectively you know, created divisions in Europe and had uh, created to a waste in Europe. So that's obviously the Chinese, again, attempting to create a rift between Washington and Brussels. But obviously, that does not reflect very well on bilateral relations. I think there's been some frustration in Europe at China's ambivalence towards Russia, the fact that China's done some things which have pleased but has not done enough, uh, given that this is something core, of course, to Europe's future. And, you know, I'll, I'll end here by stating that in the Western Balkans, um, the likes of Serbia in particular, which are candidate countries to join the EU, and this has been a topic which has been precipitated by the war in Ukraine, um, you know, where do those countries stand in terms of their dealings with China? Because um, indeed some of them are stalling on their membership uh, because they're being courted economically by China. Uh, Serbia is the biggest recipient in Europe of Belt and Road Initiative uh, financing. So, you know, this is simply adding more fuel to the fire uh, of what is uh, a comprehensive strategic partnership, uh, which is characterized largely by mistrust, and I would think in the, in the short term by increased rivalry. Thank you very much. Excellent uh, one, Dr. Benjamin. Um, thank you for that very elaborate uh, proposition that you, you came up with. I think very, very uh, interesting and pertinent points to um, to perhaps well further i request all of you in the audience to uh, put up questions uh, those uh, interviewing questions that people can answer or the panelists can answer now i think we can move on uh, uh, to the to the next speaker at, at this juncture we have the, the last speaker for the session um, and our good friend don mclean gill is a resident fellow at the manila based international development and security cooperation He's a geopolitical analyst and author over, uh, with over 90 publications to his credit. He specializes in India-Southeast Asian relations and Indo-Pacific affairs. <coughs> He's also the co-author of the newly released book, The Rise of the Philippinization. Probably he can speak uh, much more than that one because it further says Philippinization is not Finlandization, uh, Finlandization. That's what he says. Perhaps he should be able to talk much more about it. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Don, and then over well, the next 20, 25 minutes, perhaps, you can dwell upon. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nand Kishore, for this opportunity. And uh, obviously, thank you for the organizers uh, for putting up such an important uh, event, a forum on a very crucial topic. Uh, I wish also thank my co-panelists, uh, the great experts, uh, Ambassador Tigunayat, uh, Dr. Benjamin Barton, for uh, really setting the stage and providing a, a great outline on uh, their respective topics. Now, uh, what I'm going to talk about today 
uh, is really the relationship, uh, the dilemma, and the engagement and competition uh, within the framework of Southeast Asia-China relations. Now, Southeast Asia, you know, as a region with an estimate of uh, 650 plus million people, uh, high economic growth rates, it's not only a major and critical geopolitical flashpoint, uh, but also considered to be the locus of China's power. Now, in a wider scope, uh, Southeast Asia is not only the geographic heart of the Indo-Pacific, as I like to call, but also a strategic area for economic development vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Europeans, uh, who are also facing economic decline, uh, particularly to demographic issues. Now, as a result, because of these uh, critical factors, uh, the way the 10 ASEAN members, the 10 Southeast Asian states, the way they paved their individual and collective paths uh, in terms of political, economic, defense relations uh, will definitely impact the future of not only regional affairs, uh, but definitely international geopolitics. Now, of course, one of the defining uh, features of uh, Southeast Asia uh, is the intensifying U.S.-China power competition. Now, however, given the decline uh, in U.S. material capabilities, and of course its constant preoccupation uh, away from the region, uh, particularly the, towards the Middle East uh, during the global war on terror, uh, and now currently uh, due to the uh, increasing tensions in Eastern Europe, uh, China continues to use this as an opportunity to consolidate its clout, its power, uh, over the smaller neighbors. So, we have to understand that because of the, uh, the critical location, the geostrategic value uh, of Southeast Asia, uh, it's important not to decipher China-Southeast Asian relations in isolation. Uh, we have to take it to several other factors into context here. Now, uh, unlike the Indian Ocean, for example, so if you can see uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific, China has been trying to increase uh, its strategic footprints um, as Ambassador Triganayat has rightfully mentioned, engaging in uh, significant economic activity, uh, which later has the potential to serve its strategic interests, or as many may want to call as geopositional balancing, uh, is something that China has been doing. So really spending more while putting less risk in terms of armed conflict is what it has been doing in other parts of the world. Uh, however, in the Southeast Asian region, uh, this is where China has a clear strategic advantage. Uh, and the way it engages with Southeast Asian countries really is different from the other parts of the world where it uh, wishes to dominate. Uh, in fact, in Southeast Asia, we can see a lot more uh, of assertiveness towards um, the smaller Southeast Asian countries. Now, it's, it's important to note, like throughout history, uh, since 1989, uh, during the, the massacre, uh, the dreadful massacre, of course, the, the pro-democracy protests uh, in 1989. And until the 1990s, especially during the ASEAN Plus Three Summit uh, in 1997, uh, China has really made great efforts to demonstrate its good neighborliness and friendship to the countries of Southeast Asia. Many would actually like to call this the, uh, the good neighbor strategy or the good neighborhood strategy uh, that China seeks to incorporate. Now, it really has two definite objectives in incorporating such a strategy. Uh, the first would be to dispel uh, any concerns among ASEAN countries regarding the China threat, given the China rise. Now, we can see this throughout the 1950s, um, when, uh, you know, at the heyday of, uh, of uh, the Western, uh, Western countries' reluctance towards engaging with China. Um, that was before the 70s when China became a part uh, of U.S. policy uh, against the Soviet Union. Uh, but as we can see here, China during that particular time uh, was also happy to make concessions uh, to its neighbors just to make sure that the environment is conducive for its growth. So similarly, what we are seeing now uh, throughout the 1990s especially uh, is that given China's rise, uh, you know, it wants to also maintain a stable regional environment uh, in which it can pursue its goals of strategic economic development and, of course, more importantly, to promote Chinese leadership and influence while decreasing the influence of extra-regional powers, uh, particularly the United States, which is considered to be 
uh, the traditional security provider in Southeast Asia. It has two treaty allies, the Philippines and Thailand for that matter, uh, and it also seeks to solidify its engagements there. But however, uh, in the 1990s, China's top priority uh, in managing territorial disputes, it had a, a major dispute with the Philippines in the late 1990s um, uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, its purpose really, its strategy, its whole good neighborhood strategy was not really to pursue uh, a fast settlement uh, of these disputes. Now, it wasn't in China's interests really to, uh, uh, you know, to, to effectively conclude the disputes, uh, but really to create uh, stability and really to promote the status quo while expanding uh, political dialogues and economic cooperations uh, with the neighboring countries in Southeast Asia, which primarily talks about deepening its influence a brief example, really, is that during the declaration and the code, uh, declaration and the conduct of parties uh, in the South China Sea in the early 2000s, um, this was really supposed to set the stage for a formal code of conduct. But again, China just wanted to extend uh, the level of stability and status quo uh, with uh, its Southeast Asian partners, neighbors, rather, uh, without triggering any strategic loss on its behalf. So uh, the code of conduct, uh, the declaration of the conduct of parties uh, was merely a loose pledge uh, to peacefully settle uh, the differences uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, however, importantly, the declaration gave no indication uh, that the COC will seek to resolve the disputes. Uh, that's the catch. And in fact, it does not even require the parties to adhere to its terms. So the non-binding nature, the uncertainty, really puts a lot of Southeast Asian countries in the dark. Um, and this is something that China would want in its favor in order, and as it continues to consolidate power. So really to extend uh, you know, the peace flag, but at the same time uh, engaging in activities that would promote uh, its leadership and dominance in the region. Now, a great opportunity uh, really came out in the early 2000s for China. Uh, during the U.S. global war on terror, uh, China sought to operationalize its good neighborhood strategy further. Um, you know, as we see, President George W. Bush significantly pivoted away uh, from Southeast Asia and towards the Middle East, uh, particularly on the, uh, against the backdrop of uh, the war on terror. And uh, China was able to position itself uh, as a robust economic partner to ASEAN countries, and obviously against the backdrop of the dreadful Asian financial crisis, which really left a dent uh, on the reputation of the West and Western institutions uh, on Southeast Asian countries, and of course their public opinion. Now, China wanted to leverage that to its favor. Uh, another important point is along with India, China was the first non-ASEAN country uh, to accede to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, which is a significant thing uh, in projecting ASEAN centrality in the region. So it's really doing its best to indicate great amounts of symbolism, uh, including the Strategic Partnership for Peace and Prosperity and cooperation in various uh, non-traditional security issues. So really, uh, it was trying to maintain a significant uh, projection uh, of itself that no, it's contrary to what many have said about a, a unpeaceful rise of China and that China does not support any hegemony. Uh, it seeks to work uh, within the existing foundations and debunk really any form of dominance in the region. Um, again, but at the same time during this particular period, uh, as it was uh, significantly important for the growth of China, uh, China's integration into the US-led liberal order uh, allowed it or, or made it maintain uh, constructive relations with the U.S. Uh, and Southeast Asian countries as the West, uh, for that matter of fact, uh, you know, it was considered to be a major source uh, of China's material rise in terms of capital, uh, in terms of technology, and of course, institutional influence uh, in international organizations. So, of course, China had to play its cards right, uh, make sure to maximize the... Uh, uh, the, the assistance that it is getting, uh, maintain a positive uh, environment in Southeast Asia, uh, and at the same time, uh, this would, and as it consolidates power, um, we could see in the long run the changes to its approach uh, in the region and beyond. So many, however, uh, observers 
looked at this particular policy as a wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, just really waiting for the right moment uh, to pounce uh, and really to consolidate its dominance. So uh, Dr. Barton talked about the, uh, the uh, 2008 uh, crisis. Uh, you know, for Beijing, really 2008 uh, illustrated a significant uh, regional shift in terms of the balance of power uh, towards China or in China's favor. With the 2008-2009 um, global financial crisis, uh, this cast a significant doubt uh, on the U.S. and Western economy, uh, which was something that China projected throughout uh, and projected itself as an alternative to uh, the failing Washington consensus during that time. Uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there were uh, significant uh, discussions on what we believe to be the Beijing consensus uh, to serve as an alternative uh, for developing countries and low-income countries. So China's rise did not slow down throughout the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis. And throughout this period, China continued to amass uh, considerable material capabilities, which in turn, of course, resulted uh, in more assertive maneuvers, uh, particularly uh, in Southeast Asia, among the Southeast Asian states. So examples of these recent uh, events during these periods, uh, you know, submitting the nine-dash line map to the UN uh, in 2009, uh, China's increasing uh, assertive activities in the Spratly Islands, uh, six to seven major incursions in Philippine claimed waters as early as 2011. In fact, the early parts of 2011, um, the, the establishment of a unilateral fishing ban in the South China Sea um, and increasing, of course, uh, its ability to project more power in the region. And, uh, you know, this was significantly recognized by the United States, uh, the gap that it had really left wide open for China to, uh, to uh, operationalize to its benefit. Um, now, this led to, of course, uh, the, uh, the pivot to Asia, uh, strategy as we are all uh, aware of. And, uh, you know, as we can see, despite the attempts of the pivot to Asia, you know, China's ability to really uh, make most out of the opportunities provided to it throughout history before this, uh, it really didn't take any opportunity to miss any advantage uh, to really consolidate its clout over Southeast Asian countries. In fact, uh, more prob problematically, um, the fault lines have been created within ASEAN. Uh, in fact, in 2012, 2016, the unprecedented inability of ASEAN to uh, establish a joint uh, statement uh, because of Cambodia's resistance. Uh, and as we can see, Cambodia's um, uh, uh, deepening relations with China, of course, in addition to Laos, uh, Brunei, for that matter, uh, we can see that these are the areas, these are the, uh, the areas, the domains in which Chinese influence is seen. So really the, the fault lines within ASEAN, the lack of uh, collective approach uh, towards dealing with an assertive neighbor uh, is something that China uh, was really uh, looking into. And uh, this was really working towards its favor. So despite the rebalance strategy, uh, the pivot to Asia, Geopolitically speaking, we have to understand uh, that Southeast Asian countries do seek uh, a proactive presence of the U.S., uh, the traditional security uh, provider, um, to balance China's growing influence. However, they are also quite aware that other than the geographical constraint that the U.S. faces, uh, in addition to its material decline, uh, there's also that level of preoccupation in other parts of the world uh, which really worries Southeast Asian countries regarding the U.S. consistency uh, towards their plight in, South China, in the Southeast Asian region. And even allies like the Philippines and Thailand uh, even continue to walk a tight rope as not to exacerbate uh, the issue further and would make China, you know, uh, create more um, uh, areas of problem uh, in terms of bilateral engagement. So based on the population, based on its military power and its role uh, as the engine of regional economic growth, China's dominance in Southeast Asia compels its neighbors really to adjust uh, their national policies based on uh, China's preferences, which is something that um, 
is because of the geopolitical reality of the situation, uh, these smaller countries are tied to, um, to really compromise their national interests because of an assertive uh, immediate neighbor, despite the economic benefits that they are receiving. And, and they are all aware of this, but however, because of the geopolitical reality, uh, the options are quite limited for them to really distangle away from China. And uh, again, as the periods proceeded, uh, we, we have seen uh, significant levels of encroachment uh, on coastal states EEZ, ramming of boats, uh, recently Philippine, Vietnam fishing boats, Vietnamese fishing boats, um, increasing numbers and the persistence of Chinese uh, vessels also aimed at consolidating uh, China's control and challenges, which really challenges the notion of innocent passage. Uh, and of course, it's uh, incorporation of gray zone strategies uh, in the South China Sea uh, is something that is, uh, it, it's continuously happening. And then just recently, there was the maritime militia uh, in Philippine claimed territories in the South China Sea uh, and within the Philippine EEZ, uh, where China really wants to maintain its dominance there, and it, which is a breach of international law. So really questioning and really uh, compromising the sovereign rights uh, of Southeast Asian countries is something that we are seeing uh, significantly these days. Now, fast forward to the Trump government. Uh, obviously, it is aware uh, that um, you know China's uh, engagements in the region, its dominance, uh, and of course, the power that it has amassed throughout the years will continue to rise. And of course, to the benefit of China uh, and to the uh, to to the. Uh, uh, it serves as a significant challenge, of course, to those who wish to engage with Southeast Asian countries proactively uh, based on democratic values and cooperation that would really seek to balance out and create stability in the region uh, against the dominating efforts of China. So the Trump government's Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, for that matter, really recognizes two points, very important points. Uh, the first is that the recognition of U.S. hardship uh, in effectively balancing China's interests alone. Now, we can see this uh, because of the uh, uh, revival of the Quad. Uh, the U.S. continues to put more emphasis on cooperating with like-minded states because it is aware of its inability, of course, to directly confront China in uh, the locus of China's power geographically in Southeast Asia. So it has extended uh, a, a framework in which the Quad countries, India, Japan, Australia, and the U.S., could uh, systematically engage on multidimensional approaches uh, to balance uh, China's um, assertive rise in the region. And of course, the second point that we need to consider is that the U.S.'s recognition of the multipolar world order. Now, this is very important. As we can see, gone were the days of U.S. hegemony, gone were the days of the bipolar structure, and the rising uh, ongoing process of multipolarity is something that we will uh, be experiencing in the years to come. And it will continue to gain uh, uh, strength, especially with rising powers uh, throughout Asia, uh, India for that matter, China, um, we can include Japan uh, for that matter as well. Uh, and in fact, uh, the tilt of, ba uh, of the balance of power from the West to the East uh, is also something that will greatly shape the global geopolitical landscape. So really what, what happens is that uh, because of this situation, you know, Trump's incorporation of the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, the power competition with China, uh, the trade war with China. Um, but we have to understand, despite the attempts uh, to really win, uh, you know, the hearts and minds of Southeast Asian countries and really try to draw them away from China's orbit and influence, uh, we have to understand that uh, Southeast Asian countries have become uh, deeply rooted uh, under Chinese influence uh, because of all these years that China was able to amass uh, its influence on them. So really, if, even if we look into the ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific, uh, it is worded quite safely uh, in order to avoid exacerbating the situation uh, in the region and really to worsen the U.S.-China power competition in the region. So really, uh, the Southeast Asian countries are walking a very fine line uh, in order of balancing their interests, appeasing China's assertion, and of course, wanting to maintain proactive engagements with other powers that may balance China's rise. Now, we go into the Biden administration. The last few points that I'd want to make. 
of course, China maintains a significant position uh, in the Biden administration's uh, Asia strategy, Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, but looking into it, uh, it is worded to be less, um, you know, less uh, uh, competitive compared to how Trump worded it. And uh, we have to understand that his approach is rather normative uh, in compelling China to play by the rules, uh, which states that changing China is not the objective, but rather to shape the strategic environment in which it operates in. So we can also see that the U.S. would still want to open channels of cooperation with China on a, a various uh, activities. And in fact, the war in Ukraine has shown uh, that the U.S. would still uh, indicate that it needs China's help in order to sort of uh, constrain uh, Russia's activities in Ukraine, uh, considering that China also has considerable clout vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. And we can see that there is still no clear attempt uh, to uh, em emphatically uh, create uh, a significant challenge, a direct challenge to China. And as uh, the war in Ukraine continues, uh, the U.S. preoccupation would draw it further away uh, from acting as a, or filling the shoes of the traditional security provider uh, that it once wanted to be projected as. So um, the war, as the war in Ukraine er uh, erupts, of course, um, China's position would also be recalibrated in Southeast Asia. So the preoccupation away uh, from Southeast Asia, as I have mentioned, has once again created wariness among Southeast Asian countries um, and have pulled countries like Cambodia and Laos particularly deeper into China's orbit, uh, including uh, one of the most recent agreements between the Cambodian and Chinese army, uh, which really sets the tone uh, for stronger influence of China at the expense of U.S. influence. Now, we can see that there is this uh, ongoing reality that is unfolding as well in Southeast Asia. And what more, the inability of NATO to step in uh, directly uh, in Ukraine uh, to avoid the, uh, uh, the continuous bloodshed of the Ukrainians, uh, the, uh, the innocent Ukrainian lives is also a worry for ASEAN. And in fact, the failure of the Afghanistan withdrawal, which up to now creates a lot of humanitarian casualties, a lot of problems for the innocent Afghans, is something that Southeast Asian countries are also worried about regarding uh, their wariness towards uh, uh, U.S. involvement in the region. And of course, the possibility of whether the U.S. can uh, serve as a robust and proactive security provider in the region without exacerbating the situation further. So... Southeast Asian countries are now looking for strong partners, uh, proactive partners that will not only lessen their dependency on China, uh, but will also draw them away from the intensifying U.S.-China power competition. Now, while the U.S. is still considered to be a significant portion of Southeast Asian policy, uh, there is a huge attempt to diversify partnerships. We can see from Vietnam, the Philippines, Indonesia, Myanmar, uh, Myanmar um, uh, uh, and other smaller countries, Cambodia for that matter. And this is where I believe India can play a significant role. Uh, not only is it considered as a security provider among a lot of Southeast Asian countries, but also a peaceful developmental partner uh, with no narrowly defined ambitions in the region. Now, this becomes very important. And of course, India's adherence to strategic autonomy is also something that is significantly welcome uh, in Southeast Asia, as of course, even they themselves are wary of joining any form of bloc politics that would put their national interests at risk. So India's presence in trilateral and multilateral engagements, uh, such as the India, Japan, um, Indonesia trilateral, or the India, France, um, Indonesia trilateral, uh, is something that would really ensure uh, Southeast Asian countries that the arrangements uh, will not become rigid extensions of bloc politics. Uh, and it would also maintain their national interest, uh, engage in economic, political, defense activities, and at the same time, slowly. Uh, this will not happen overnight, but this will serve as a slow alternative um, for China, of course, uh, sorry, for Southeast Asian countries uh, to really lessen their dependence on China without uh, compromising any security risks uh, immediately. So as a result, and this is where the topic of Philippine Indianization comes in, uh, the book that I have co-written really talks about uh, the Philippine strategy from the Philippine point of view um, to really try to consolidate strategies 
that would not only draw it further deeper into U.S.-China competition, but create uh, an, an, an inclusive or an, a uh, conducive atmosphere to leverage its position uh, in the Indo-Pacific to engage uh, with diverse sets of partners that would be able to be a win-win. Uh, and this is something that many Southeast Asian countries now are looking towards. And we can see through the engagements, uh, there has been a significant attempt to diversify partnerships uh, that also share similar concerns, um, uh, adherence to transparent democratic engagements, but at the same time would not provide a significant risk of escalation vis-a-vis -vis China. So as a result, Southeast Asian countries are in need of consistent and proactive collaborations that will be win-win uh, in terms of security, stability, and development. And as of now, as we can see, as China continues to grow, uh, despite, of course, the, the backlogs in its BRI, uh, it has lost, I think, 49 to 50 percent plus uh, throughout the pandemic in terms of profit or uh, uh, developments towards the BRI. A lot of pushbacks are also happening. Now, these are the opportunities for Southeast Asian countries to devise proactive uh, arrangements, uh, collective, uh, sub-regional, or regional for that matter, um, in order really to uh, maintain and to harness uh, their collective cooperation and to extend uh, their partnerships throughout the world for, of course, their national interests and the stability uh, of the region and beyond. So uh, I wish to end my uh, discussion there. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Don. I think uh, excellent uh, presentation indeed. There's no doubt about it at all. Okay, I think excellent uh, presentations. All three of them um, gave beautiful expositions on, on, on the way China um, has been in, in different regions. I think it also comes with the amount of experience that they have been having for a while now. Um, now, what I would uh, like to do is just move into the chat box and then look for there are certain questions uh, and then perhaps we can uh, go one after the other. Uh, there's one question uh, that perhaps all three of you can answer. Uh, it's on... Um, the question is very interesting because it's asking about uh, will there be a civilizational clash? Is it unearthing Huntington? Would it not be more appropriate to describe it as an increasing clash of interest? That's the first question anybody can answer. Ms. Sangamitra Malik, uh, a PhD scholar working on BRI at the Department of Politics and International Studies, um, Pondicherry University, she uh, is asking a question, how China is responsible for decaying democracy in South Asia? particularly its involvement in uh, many BRI-engaged countries like what's happening in Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Perhaps either of you, all, all three of you can give your own comments on that front. And uh, and then, uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop it there. I think one of the uh, very other interesting question is by the ambassador himself for uh, Don as well as uh, Dr. Barton, which we can take up now. We'll, we'll probably start with. So I will request Ambassador Anil to start off and then followed by, in the same order that we uh, had the presentations, followed by Dr. Benjamin and then Don. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Kishore. Um, well, it's a, an interesting question uh, that how China is responsible for de decaying democracy in South Asia, particularly its involvement in many BRI engaged countries. I mean, I would not say that uh, China is at all responsible uh, for decay of democracy in the countries. What we are seeing actually is the access of democracy. Uh, if you see Sri Lanka, there is a lot of demonstrations against the government, which they accused of conniving with China as far as debt, debt uh, diplomacy or debt trap were concerned. And likewise, we are seeing even in Nepal, uh, the similar kind of a situation that is, uh, that, that is happening. I mean, it's no longer... Uh, that China's uh, uh, role can be seen as venomous, uh, so to say. I mean, I in India, those of us who know India, I see that China's role has been that of a sahukar, you know, the money lender, which used to be in the ancient I mean, system, old system in India. They give the money against certain assets. And if you're not able to pay, they take away your assets. In this country, they are ready to take over whatever you cannot pay for for 99-year lease or Hamman Tota project or wherever it is. So what I feel is likewise in Pakistan. Now, Pakistan is very different compared to Sri Lanka and Nepal. 
as or Bangladesh for that matter, Pakistan has actively sought a very closer bonding with China because Pakistan is one country that has always been used to alliances and it has thrived because of the alliances. Whether it is with the Americans earlier in the center era, it is a non NATO ally even now. It has not been redesignated from that. Whether it is trying to partner with Russia, but it needs China's complete support in order to continue its tirade against India. Because its policy is essentially India centric. Hopefully, under the new government, there may be some change. So, I do not subscribe to the idea that China is undermining democracy in a way because whenever there is people who rise, that's what we will see that the democracy will thrive. And Sri Lanka obviously is seeing that and Nepal also in certain ways. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Dr. Benjamin. All right, thank you. Um, um, thank you also to Christian and to Sangamitra for both of those questions. I'll try and uh, actually link both of them up. I think uh, Christian was perhaps referring to a point in my slides uh, pertaining to, um, because I was pointing out the civilizational differences um, between the EU and China. Hi, Christian. Um, yeah, uh, perhaps not as far as um, Huntingdon. That's not, that wasn't really my intention, but it was really more just to showcase the fact that under uh, the leadership under Xi Jinping and the normative approach to foreign policy, which has been characteristic of the EU, you know, from um, well, pretty much from the beginnings of the common foreign and security policy, and perhaps even beyond that, um, the reality is that they now stand at polar opposites. I think prior to Xi becoming president, uh, China was not so was you know was more the traditional foreign policy approach, which was more passive, of you know characteristic of the kind of uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, approach to um, foreign policy, you know, trying to remain more discreet. Now that China's stance is more overt. I think China has not hesitated, whether it's bilaterally directly pertaining to Europe, and we can give the example of, you know, of Brexit, uh, where although the UK is no longer a member state, it was at the time, um, and if this was a core issue for the EU in a way it still remains, um, there is, you know, there were reports of China uh, meddling through largely through social media, echo chambers, perhaps not as uh, overtly as Russia was, but definitely meddling um, you know, in, in a way which therefore undermined, uh, I would say, British democracy and European integration uh, in the same full swoop. So there's that. But also, if you look beyond, if you look at, for instance, Chinese companies purchasing, um, you know, or making acquisitions into uh, the media, uh, media companies in, in, on the African continent, it's a good example, uh, and how that then impacts, you know, freedom of the press, the image which is projected of China, and this obviously goes against the kind of values which are being propagated by the EU in its own foreign policy. You know, a normative approach which sometimes I think irks particularly uh, countries in the global south because they don't like the conditionality, conditionality aspect which goes with dealing with the EU, that's for sure. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, this is clearly an affront by, by China at the EU's own foreign policy values, even if only indirectly. So uh, yes, I think it, we are talking about uh, in terms of their own image projection to entities which now currently really stand at, at polar opposites. So uh, insofar as the, the Chinese regime, insofar as the values which are core to EU foreign policy, I, it does seem like um, more and more this kind of civilizational clash, um, which is unfortunate because you know it, it doesn't really predict um, a, a rosy future. Uh, in fact, it would rather predict uh, an ill-fated future but um, that is the situation where we stand right now. In terms of uh, bringing the, the second question and turning this time to the, uh, the Indo-Pacific or the Indian Ocean, I mean, I would agree with the ambassador that I don't think China has really co contributed towards de decaying democracy. And in fact, I would argue the opposite, and I have in a, in a publication which came out um, about 18 months ago now, uh, looking at the Belt and Road Initiative, the Maritime Silk Road Initiative in um, the Indian Ocean. In fact, I think China misread some of the uh, democratic dynamics in Sri Lanka and in Maldives in particular, uh, which I think is, this is definitely on India's side. Um, I mean, ultimately, you know, this is India's backyard. It's a, you know, 
maybe that's a term which not everyone appreciates, but that's, you know, India acts as a hegemon in this part of the world. And one of India's advantages, I think, is its, its democratic nature and its ability to perhaps, you know, as a result, better understand the way that democracies work. Of course, there are always surprises. Of course, we cannot always perfectly predict, predict the future. But if you go back to, you know, Mahindra Rajapaksa, when he was prime minister, um, he had built a very solid relationship with China and Chinese state-owned companies. And China, through the, the Maritime Silk Road Initiative, was banking on his re-election. There, hence, the Hamban Tota projects, or the White Elephant projects, in the Hamban Tota International Airport and port, right? Of course, right now, their white elephant projects, maybe in the future, uh, they will turn to be successful projects, we don't know. But they didn't work, right? Because there was that backlash in 2015. And the same thing in Maldives in 2018. You know, uh, China also uh, banked on the wrong horse, um, uh, backed the wrong horse in that particular um, um, election, right? And Again, this was after numerous BRI projects, right? The bridge collect connecting Malay to Hulu Malay, which is really uh, seen as fundamental for the quality of life in Maldives. Um, you know, the amount of tourists that China was bringing uh, to Maldives and therefore revenue, uh, which obviously tapered off with uh, the outbreak of COVID-19. There was a sense that, you know, China was again going to bankroll uh, a, 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 a victory for um, an incumbent, uh, one who had good relations with China and which had compromised the nature of Maldives' relations with India as a result. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, this is personally, I think, one of the areas where China is not very well versed in, and that is understanding the dynamics of democracy. And purely and simply because in China, this does not exist. This is a foreign concept and one which is rejected uh, by the leadership. So, you know, how can they possibly understand it uh, if they don't even accept it or acknowledge it. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Benjamin. I think I think we may slightly disagree on that front of so calling India as a hegemon because we are are so concerned about we don't even want to call ourselves as big brother. We would want to call ourselves as elder brother. Uh, you know that's uh, that's that sensitive we are with regard to the connotations. And nevertheless, I think facts are facts. It doesn't change things uh, as we look at as academicians or practitioners. Um, I, I also have a very interesting question by our Commodore uh, Vasan, uh, my my very senior uh, friend and a teacher whom I look up to. He asked this question, so I, I'll come back to Ambassador's questions to both of you as well. Um, it looks like China, uh, in its march ahead to achieve its uh, goal is least bothered about the backlash from around the world. Do you see China changing its ways? What will make it mend its ways is a question that's uh, directed. I would, I would request Don to answer that and then also answer something that was there in the previous uh, round of questions so that he can answer both of that and then we can come back the other way around where after Don, Mag uh, this thing Benjamin can answer and then Ambassador Anil. Don, over uh, please. Yes, thank you, Dr. Kishore. And uh, the question is definitely relevant. Uh, we have to understand uh, that China's influence really stems uh, from its ability to project economic clout uh, throughout the world. And this is something that we can see throughout its engagements in Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Indian Ocean region, and beyond. So really, uh, in the words of uh, uh, Dr. Robert Kaplan, for that matter, uh, he said rightfully that uh, China's empire will only remain uh, attractive just until that there is an alternative to fill in that gap. So what what needs to be done really is to tap China's uh, uh, China's root of its influence, which is um, economic development projects, etc. Because what we can see, and we link it to the BRI for that matter, is that China really uh, does not have a rigid criteria which makes the BRI very attractive. In fact, it taps on countries with low to zero uh, credit ratings. Um, and then at the end of the day, when they're unable to pay, uh, they get a uh, hold of the, uh, the strategic assets of that particular country. Now, this lack of uh, transparency um, has also been fueling uh, negative sentiments among uh, the public uh, throughout the country. And uh, if we look 
towards South Asia for that matter. Yes, China has invested a lot of flashy, uh, uh, a lot of flashy mega projects uh, in uh, uh, throughout South Asia, but really public opinion is against it because they see no significant social economic benefit that trickles down to the ordinary people. And this is something that is to the advantage of other um, major powers like India, which really invests uh, uh, to the benefit of the people. As we can see uh, in Afghanistan, uh, pre-withdrawal, uh, pre where India had a significant uh, uh, investment there that is also people-centric, uh, is something that countries like India have a significant edge over China. And as these, uh, as these uh, uh, shocks continue uh, throughout the world, in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, uh, perhaps other countries in Africa, and of course uh, the, uh, the pushback uh, towards China's projects, um, because significantly of public sentiment against it, uh, this is something that would be uh, a major force uh, that may impede China's ambitions to project more clout economically. And as Dr. Barton rightfully said, China is uh, unfamiliar with, of course, the forces of democratic uh, elements uh, to shape uh, foreign policy. And this is something that is to the advantage of those countries that seek a better future in a more transparent democratic light. Uh, and this may be something that may mend China's ways. Um. Thank you, Don. I think there's also another question uh, to you as you're answering uh, from our ambassador. Uh, we ask you this question, is, uh, is China not honoring uh, ICJ judgment an issue in upcoming PH elections? So perhaps you can answer that as well. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, of course, thank you, Ambassador, for this very timely question. Uh, in fact, uh, it's very interesting to note uh, that according to all official and unofficial surveys, the elections would be on May 9, uh, just a few days from now. And the leading candidate is someone who we can see to have a significant level of continu continuity uh, uh, towards uh, President Duterte's policy, which means that there would be more engagements with China, uh, setting aside, of course, or downplaying um, major uh, victories such as the, uh, the tribunal victory uh, in order to forge closer relations. But at the same time, uh, the leading candidate uh, says that he also wishes to honor uh, the U.S. treaty alliance uh, and wishes to incorporate it in every engagement. But then we can see no significant attempt to really draw much attention uh, towards the arbitral victory uh, compared to, of course, the second candidate that's coming up in the polls. But really, there's a huge margin uh, between the first and the second. Uh, the second, of course, uh, the vice president currently uh, says that uh, we will definitely uh, incorporate this in every level of engagement. And until China does not adhere to the victory, and there would be no significant engagement. So there's really a black and white response between the leading two candidates. Uh, but if uh, the leading candidate uh, maintains his lead towards the election, then we can see a sort of continuity uh, to what President Duterte uh, now is doing towards China. So there are you know, levels of, uh, of uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, co competition, but really it really would be overpowered by the willingness to cooperate. Um, thank you, Don. I think the next question uh, from the ambassador goes to um, Dr. Barton. He asks you this question, how much impact the individual countries' relation with China have an impact on EU's unifocal policy vis-a-vis -vis China, or that's not an issue at all? Perhaps you can comment. Alternatively, do you also see opportunity for China in transatlantic differences that are yet to be bridged fully? Yeah, thanks uh, to the ambassador for those uh, two questions. So, um, obviously, uh, you know, if you look back, um, there are some member states which dominate the EU's China policy, and I think I, I quickly referred to the role that Germany has played. I mean, it's a little bit galling uh, for some member states to accept that the only country which has a positive trade balance with China is Germany. Um, you know, whereas the rest make up that rather huge uh, trade deficit. So uh, obviously that because of that reality, um, you know, it's difficult for Germany not to want to position itself on a whole host of other issues. And I mean, I, I would, I'm curious to see how things are going to evolve now that uh, Chancellor Merkel has, has stepped down and there's a new government, uh, which is no longer, you know, led by the, the center right in Germany. 
um, because it seems that this German government is willing to move away from some of the past practices of you know Germany within the EU. Um, and not all EU member states has always been satisfied uh, with the position taken up by, by Germany. Um, so I think that, yeah, that you can definitely uh, point to individual countries who, who, who have an influence. Um, and of course, we think of, well, here I'm alluding to Germany, I've mentioned France as well, uh, which are usually the drivers for European integration, and therefore the most influential member states. And, you know, there's always that saying that um, if, uh, if um, Germany and France are not at the wheel, then Europe doesn't basically do much. Uh, and I think now you've got two rather complementary governments, especially with Macron's re-election, you know, he can only just, he can focus on that. He doesn't have to worry about uh, what's going to happen over uh, the next five years. So I think you'll see a much more um, proactive EU on the international stage. And that also applies to China. I think the recent statements, for example, uh, warning member states not to, to step too far out of line, uh, pointing to Hungary, is is a novelty because, um, you know, Orban has done pretty much what he's wanted without ever really fa facing the wrath. And I think that that was largely thanks to the protection that he had from Angela Merkel. But if you look at even smaller member states, and I come back to the example of um, the, Baltic, uh, the Baltic states and Lithuania, you know, the, its willingness, and in fact, others who, who bandwagoned on what the Lithuanians did, uh, and that is to, you know, entertain a greater role vis-a-vis uh, -vis the relationship with Taiwan, which of course irks Beijing, because that is a highly sensitive and sovereign issue, which, and of course, you know, the core elements of China's foreign policy are non-interference. So, um, you know, I think, yeah, you, it's important to keep that dynamic in mind. But of course, the, the larger, more established member states are the ones which usually tend to have more influence. In terms of the transatlantic differences, China is capable of, of finding cracks and exploiting them. Um, but if you look overall uh, at China's record, you know, the reality is that the transatlantic relationship is, is so solid that China is not able to really do much. And I, I'll just take one example, and this is to do with the arms embargo, you know, which, again, is not practically, physically of, of tremendous importance because China can still purchase, um, you know, equipment from European uh, arms industries, which are of dual use nature, right? They, they cannot simply purchase uh, the, let's say, directly um, uh, weaponry of, of, the, of the highest or most strategic order. OK, um, this was an attempt in, in you know, the early 2000s to, to get the EU to drop its arms embargo. And by leaning on a few member states, notably the British and the Spanish at the time, you know, China really felt it was that close to getting the Europeans to reverse. Now, what got the Europeans to change their mind was the anti-secession law of 2005, which was targeting Taiwan. But of course, behind that, you had the United States, uh, although, you know, it was President Bush Jr. at the time, and there was rather a lot of transatlantic tension, um, China's not really been able to exploit that. And that's, I think, one of the key areas in its relationship with the EU, which shows that despite all the goodwill and despite all the efforts, uh, I think China cannot simply get the EU to disassociate itself from the US. And, and going right, right back to the very beginning of my presentation, if you look, at back, look back to the prospects that there was back then and to the reality there is now, the fact is that, no, China has not succeeded uh, to, to create or, or to take advantage of, the, of any kind of rift between Washington and Brussels. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barton. I think all three of you can perhaps uh, give your own understanding on this. There's one question on how effective is the process of sinicization and the Chinese wolf warrior diplomacy? Probably we'll start with the diplomat. <laughs> Sir, you, sir, uh, I think you're muted. Please unmute yourself. Well, firstly, thank you, Don, and thank you, Dr. Barton, for the explanation. Uh, the problem with transatlantic alliance, in my view, did not lie with the Chinese so much, as much as with leader like Trump. So uh, we could have ruptured it in no way, I mean, very quickly. So one doesn't know how it will play out eventually. But thank you very much for a very potent explanations. In both the cases. Uh, 
well one thing is i would say that as far as there was, it mixes the other question also uh, whether china is uh, bothered about backlash and all that and we see i mean i think that china china's course correction mechanism is a bit slow and that's where the question of wool warrior diplomacy comes in so when you become arrogant and you start thinking that because you have so much economic heft and power you start misleading the situation to a great extent i think this time even in russia that has been done so that is something that is a, a, a problem that china has but it does course correct for example in the in the focac or the africa uh, when there were a lot of debts last meeting it written, it has written off about 60 billion dollars uh, and that provided additional loans and uh, uh, to to compensate for that so this definitely continues as far as sinicization is concerned um, i wonder if that is a real project which they have really taken over of course it all from 2009 i think china started thinking more of a soft power uh, to go along with it and they have uh, through this confucius center which are plenty of them all over and they have been doing a tremendous work i must say especially i can see in the middle east and africa they have done very well in the middle east i mean for the first time you are seeing that the uh, the chinese language culture civilization everything is being taught uh, and made a compulsory language in saudi arabia and some of the countries which will have an impact because once you have the exposure of that kind uh, that will definitely happen but so far i would say that china sinicization within china has been more of a han category they have tried to hanization of their own country to the extent that it has become extremely difficult to have some kind of a diversity there be it in the xinjiang province or in northern mongolia or elsewhere and this wool warrior diplomacy they tried to when they were being uh, we are talking of wuhan virus and all that then obviously chinese got on to the thing their instructions went to their ambassadors to fight out at every level of the way then very soon they realized that it was getting a tremendous backlash from everywhere no country liked it from the smallest to the biggest now we are seeing what happened in lithuania also so president xi jinping in the last meeting in the cpc and all had told all the diplomats and others to go slow in it and avoid being like that they have changed the perception tried to change their modus operandi i guess but it is not to say that it will not come back again or they will not do so dr benjamin yeah i'll touch upon the um, the uh, war for you i mentioned only briefly because it's um, not something that i particularly been looking at uh, myself although of course it's difficult to ignore uh, for anyone who takes an interest in chinese foreign policy um i mean i, I guess my uh, response to this is, is similar to any questions which come about um, the non interference policy and you might look at me quizzically to think what the link is between the two uh but that is you know what's the domestic dimension to the wolf warrior diplomacy of course it's largely targeted at um dismissing any criticism or to the contrary going on the offensive and is characteristic of uh the Chin chinese foreign policy approach ever since xi jinping became uh president which is more hawkish um and uh, you know contrary to the period before 2012 uh where you know chinese ambassadors would never dare to go on to western social media platforms or international social media platforms in order to promote or uh, uh vice versa to defend a chinese policy stance on a given issue um you know now it's 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 gone 360 degrees the other, in the opposite direction whereby in fact you've got to be out there you've got to be defending uh, um china by all means possible um and that is i think fundamental in terms of your own success and survival within the higher ranks um of the foreign policy establishment uh but i i think that's why i i think it's interesting to cast this uh more from a domestic lens in terms of what does it mean uh to the leadership uh, and what does it mean in terms of the relationship between you know those who sit with xi jinping and decide and those who execute uh are on the ground um so it, it, really i think it's just symptomatic um of that kind of change of position of stance 
uh, in terms of the, let's say, public diplomacy uh, of Chinese uh, foreign policy under Xi Jinping, which I imagine is only going to continue, if not be accentuated, um, if uh, the third term is confirmed, not so much if, I guess, when it is confirmed. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Benjamin. Uh, Dr. Dunn? Uh, oh, yes, uh, just a very brief note uh, to the comments, uh, just to add a little bit uh, on uh, the wolf warrior diplomacy, coercive diplomacy that China has been doing, uh, really reflects uh, its rise in material capabilities and it, what it feels to be uh, its ability to be able to boss everyone around because of its clout over a lot of countries. Now, particularly what is happening in Ukraine is something that would be a point of reckoning for China and the way it seeks to use its diplomacy and engagements throughout the international system. Uh, of course, with a spotlight, of course, on China and Russia for this matter, particularly from the West, um, this may be an issue for China to continue uh, such uh, coercive measures and of course maybe a chance to recalibrate it to something more um, a little bit more benign and undercover in terms of uh, maintaining what it wants to get through in the international system and at the same time preserving its uh, its name as it also seeks to project itself as a responsible stakeholder uh, despite how uh, how hard it may be to uh, accept such notions uh, it, it, that is the challenge that it is facing now the branding so how will it want to brand itself in the international system? Uh, while the wolf warrior diplomacy may have worked in the first few years, um, and now because of the shocks and inconsistencies in the international system, there are challenges in terms of branding China in the global stage. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a paradox between uh, trying to be responsible and wanting for peace and at the same time uh, being coercive, particularly in its own neighborhood. Uh, so this is a problem that China will continue to face uh, as it brings it to a dilemma of how it wants to present itself and how it wishes to seek and uh, gain uh, its uh, global ambitions. Thank you, Don. I think um, very well put. Now, um, as we have uh, also come to the last part of um, the session itself, on the overall topic, I would want all three of you to make your final remarks for a few minutes. And then with that, perhaps uh, we will we will close. Uh, so Don, you can perhaps uh, start from your side itself. A few closing remarks from your side. Thank you, Dr. Kishore. It's again a true pleasure uh, to have the chance to interact with you, and of course to be uh, in the same virtual floor as uh, who I consider a mentor, Ambassador Tiganide, and uh, a, gr a great uh, expert as well, Dr. Barton. Uh, the organizers for uh, putting up this very important activity. And I feel that there should be more of these uh, discussions to be able to reorient uh, uh, people, students, academics, researchers uh, towards critical issues that are impacting not only states, but of course the people within them. Uh, so again, thank you for this uh, fantastic opportunity. Uh, Dr. Benjamin? Yeah, I would simply echo um, uh, Don's words there. Um, thank you again for the, the organization of this panel. And uh, indeed, I, I fully agree that these are necessary, uh, given the times that we live in, to talk about. You know, I, I was in a panel um, just a couple of days back, which was pertaining to India's role in the Indo-Pacific in terms of its relationship with, um, with African states, East African states. You know, it shows, uh, I think, India's role as a catalyst in terms of the doubts over what the future regional and world orders will look like. So, you know, instead of just being um, observers to this, it's better to be discussing, right? To be at the, the heart of the discussion. And it's these kind of panels, I think, which are absolutely crucial also to give the Indian perspective, which is, you know, vital for international relations looking ahead um, on these different topics. I mean, you know, the, the world cannot simply uh, ignore this anymore. So um, I'm very uh, proud to be part of these discussions as well. Thank you, Dr. Thank Benjamin. You. Uh, over to you, Ambassador Anil. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kishore. I mean, I fully um, endorse the views of my esteemed co-panelists. It's absolutely true. Um, I maintain that India's biggest challenge in the years to come is going to be China. And uh, in any which way you look at it, be it uh, in Middle East, in the Indo-Pacific, Africa, wherever. And how we are going to deal with it will be the most important thing for India now. 
because China today does consider India as a strategic rival, whichever way you look at it. And uh, so I think that this was very timely, this seminar, and we should continue to have these deliberations. Something new comes out, then we hear from experts. So I was quite educated by many things today. So thank you once again for including me in this. Thank you, um, thank you Ambassador Anil. I think um, it was my pleasure to uh, chair this particular session uh, as we keep learning every day. I enjoyed thoroughly uh, being part of this session and each one of you made such amazing contribution. Already the next session is going to happen here. I see Commodore Vasan, I see Dr. Velina, uh, Nagav San, and there is also the Jagannath Panda. Everybody has already come in. I think it's fair for us to give the floor to them. Uh, over to you, Yogita. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to thank the session chair and all the speakers for such an enlightening session. Uh, please stay tuned for our next session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.